want to talk a little bit about sticky messes. And um, sticky messes of all types happen, you know. And many can be fixed with a solvent. <clears throat> a solvent, of course, is something that dissolves uh, a substance you don't want. Webster says that a sol solvent is something that takes away something that's unwanted. And um, it can work just in the natural realm. You know, I, uh, I paint a little bit sometimes. I get water-based paint on me. And if I wipe it off with soap and water really quickly, it goes away really quickly. Some uh, sticky messes take a lot longer. Um, I recently, I kind of like coconut oil for, to eat. But I get all these jars that look like this. And I was looking at them and thinking, you know, I could really use that for another purpose if I could get the label off. And I finally Googled it and found out that underneath that very um, efficient label is a lot of glue that doesn't come off real easily. And people have experimented around and found out that if you take a tablespoon of that and a tablespoon of baking soda, this is olive oil, mix it together into a paste and smear it all over the jar, First, sometimes I'll take a knife and scratch it off a little bit so that the uh, paste doesn't have to work quite so hard. So let's see. Here's the order. And then you smear the paste on, and it looks like a stickier mess. And then you wait for 30 minutes. <laughs> and then you uh, apply soap and water again, and a little bit of scotch Bright, a little bit of steel wool, and it, you can actually see what's inside of it, you know? So um, sole sticky messes are similar. Usually, they can be healed miraculously in a hurry, but often it takes a process, right? Pastor Dave has been talking to us a lot about process lately, and um, sticky messes of the soul are no exception. They, um, usually takes time, and usually there's a bunch of different things that are added to the mess to, to uh, do that. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, there's a verse in there that says, in a large household, there are containers of many types. Some are for uh, ignoble or selfish or sinful purposes, and some are for noble purposes. And if any man cleanses himself... Notice it says it puts the responsibility on us. Interesting. If we cleanse ourselves from the selfish motives, the impure motives, then we'll be a container for special purposes, made holy and useful to the master for every good work. Second Timothy chapter 2, somewhere in there. And uh, OK. Um, <clears throat> if you want, um, I didn't get, a, um, obviously, a outline completed. But some of these verses are really worth looking at again. So if you want to take notes, feel, feel free to do that. Um, so like I was saying, cleansing takes effort, according to that verse. And that might be you know, an accountability group, um, attendance, or celebrate recovery homework, or just hanging out with him you know, and uh, increasing conversation with him. Of course, there's another important part, more important part of that cleansing, and that's God's part. Um, lots of verses about that. There's a verse in Hebrews 9 that says that um, lifting, uh, you know, pouring out the blood of goats and bulls like they did in the Old Testament uh, signified for the cleansing of, of sin. It stood for that, and, but how much more will the blood of Jesus Christ who offered himself unblemished to God as a sacrifice, cleanse our consciences, yours and mine, from all the acts that lead to death so that we can serve a living God. And I like that. That really emphasizes, you know, it's, it's a teamwork thing. I've got to cooperate, and he's got to do the major work. Thank you. That, I've been warned not to hit my chest. <laughs> Thank you for more warnings. Uh, let's look at some of the ways of teaming up with him to use solvents that removes the stubborn, sticky messes. Um, they abound in all our lives, you know, the addictions. I think of first like, like porn, like gambling, like shopping even, like food, like gambling, like 
paying too much attention to what other people appear to think of me. And Celebrate Recovery, we, you've probably heard the word, we call it codependence. It's kind of making a god out of what you think rather than out of what he thinks, just relying on that too much. And, um, and then underneath those addictions are usually some bigger, quieter, more hidden, sticky messes. Um, often that we didn't do ourselves, you know, they can be trauma, trauma in the womb. Um, it may be a um, pledge that somebody who was an ancestor of ours took um, that brought in kind of a demonic foothold. Um, it may be lies, lies that are kind of sometimes bullied into us. And they kind of become a secret belief that we're fighting against. We don't want it, but it's there, and it keeps on repeating it like, like, like a bad tape. It just got stuck on replay. Uh, lies like, I'm not enough. Like, I'm inferior in some department that really matters. I'm junk. I'm a wimp. I'm ugly. I'm stupid. I'm unlovable. I caused my parents' divorce. Uh, another lie, I will never amount to anything. People, you know? including um, those, those have floated through my head at different times, probably all of us, and some of them just get stuck, and it, it's a big problem. And um, <clears throat> God specializes in solvents, of course, for all these things. He, of course, is the actual solvent with a capital S. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we know a lot of this stuff in our heads. It's, it's pretty much there. For instance... Um, if I start these verses, can you complete them? If anyone is in Christ, he is... New yeah. Old things have passed away, the new has come. Or, and my God will supply... You guys know that. You know that. Is it in your hearts? Not like my hand just was over. Um, and then this one, if God is for us... Yep, amen. And the, I really like this one. This talks about <clears throat> your identity, my identity. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion and all that, you know. Um, so his word's powerful. Second Timothy 3 says, somewhere in there says, um, I kind of just like to do the chapters and then if I'm really interested, I'll find the verses, but... 2 Timothy 3 says, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for training and rebuking and correcting. And what's the next one? Yeah, I guess that's it. So the man of God, the woman of God may be perfectly equipped for everything that God calls us to do. And um, John 15 is an interesting thing. It starts out, with uh, the first three verses go, um, I am the true vine, Jesus says, and my father is the gardener, and he prunes everything off that bears no fruit, while everything that does bear fruit, he prunes, so it'll be even more fruitful. My footnote in John says that you can, in Greek, you could either write, he prunes, or he cleanses. Either he prunes or... He uses a solvent, you know? That, that, that's um, John 15, verse 1, 2, and 3. Whole chapter's good. Right, Joe? <laughs> I kind of like that one. Um, but again, to get that truth down in my, my heart is the big challenge. I know it in my head. We can quote pieces of it, but how do you get it down here, you know? And of course, it's a complex answer. It's as complex as taking solvent, more complex than taking sticky messes off of glass jars. Um, I want to accept those truths so deeply that it shows up in my attitudes, that it shows up in my confidence in Christ, um, that it shows up in kind of an enthusiasm to, to do something risky with the person who loves me most, loves me best, saved me, my best friend, and uh, 
and I need to get good at applying the solvents he provides. Let's look at Psalm 23. Maybe you know it by heart, but I, I'll... Um, if you read the odd-numbered verses, I'll read the even-numbered verses. Okay? So, um, you're on. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be And then, so... The solvent of guidance and shepherding. <clears throat> My turn. Um, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. That uh, I'm old enough to know some of the old hymns and remember, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear. The Son of God discloses, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me that I am his own. That's, that's, that's the good part, the best part for me. You know, he, he says I belong to him, and he says that he belongs to me, and that's, that's uh, getting close to the solvent remover, you know? Um, your turn. Let's see, where are we? He leads me. He leads me in paths, your turn. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And I guess my turn. Um, even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Um, I need to marinate in that. You know, I need to saturate myself with that. Your turn. Surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I like the word mercy there. I like them all, but think about mercy for a minute. You know, it's, he says that, that if I confess my sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive me my sin. He's faithful. That means like all the time, every time. That mercy follows me and it's right there. That's a solvent for a lot of the hurts and hang-ups and wounds. There are dots that can stick to us for a long time, and then there are dots that just kind of come up during a day. There are, we haven't talked about dots yet. There are dots being bad things, okay? Negative things. Um, this is where the dots come in. This is one of my favorite little books. It's all about some wooden people. And the hero of the story is a guy by the name of Punchinello. And he's a little wooden guy who gets frustrated with the sticky mess of, li of his life and his culture. And he takes the risk to meet the woodcarver. This is an allegory. It's sort of like a parable. It stands for other things. The wooden people stand for us. The woodcarver stands for him. Okay. So somewhat illustrated, I'll show you some of the pictures. The Wemmicks were small wooden people, and they lived in this village, and the woodcarver lived at the top of the hill. Every Wemmick was different. Some of them had big noses, some had big eyes, some were tall, some were short, but they all lived in the same village, and they all were made by the same woodcarver. And every day, all day long, the Wemmicks would do only this. See if you think this village was codependent. <laughs> the, the, um, sorry. The, um, they went around. They had two little boxes. One box had gold stars in it. The other box had gray dots in it. Two um, wooden people who had nice paint and no scratches, you'd get a star for that. For ones who were kind of scratched, they would get gray dots. And be talented help, too. You could get a star for jumping over boxes. You could get a star for singing pretty songs. You could get a star for um, being able to run fast or say a lot of words, say big words like this guy. And if you couldn't do anything or you didn't fit, you'd get a gray dot. A lot of people had some gray dots. A lot of people had a mixture of both. They got a star that made them feel really good and made them want to get more stars. 
Punchinello was one of the ones who only had gray dots. Um, he tried to do something that was cool, but he'd fall over. Or he'd say something silly, or he'd fall into the puddles and, and get himself all wet and try to make excuses about it, and then it sounds silly. And he kind of liked to hang out by himself or with others who had gray dots and made him feel a little better somehow. Sounds like, you know, people who join gangs and other folks, you know? One day, though, he met a Wemmick, a wooden person who had no gray dots and no gold stars. And he was fascinated. And um, some people would look down on her for not having any stars, and they'd try to put gray dots on her, and they'd fall off. And vice versa, OK? They just didn't stick. And she asked, he asked her how she did it. Why don't you have any stars and any dots? And she said, oh, that's easy. Every day I go up to see the woodcarver at the top of the hill. And um, he said, what? He said, yeah, I just spend time with him. How does that help? Why don't you go see for yourself, she said. But will he want to see me? Well, he thought about it. He looked out of his window that night and saw all the wooden people sticking stars and dots on each other. And he said, you know, that's not right. I don't want anybody else's marks. And he decided to risk it. He decided next day he would go to the woodcarver's shop. He walked up there. And when he went in, he just about turned around and went the other direction because everything was huge. Everything was so much bigger than he was. And as he was walking out, he heard a warm voice. He said, Punchinello, how good to see you. Come and let me have a look at you. Punchinello says, you know me? He said, yeah, I made you. I named you. Woodcarvers bent over and picked up Punchinello and put him on the workbench. Seems like you've got a lot of gray dots. Punchinello said, I'm sorry, I tried really hard. Woodcarver says, you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to justify yourself to me. He said, um, I don't really care what the Olympics think. And you shouldn't either. What they think doesn't matter, Punchinello. All that matters is what I think. And I think you're pretty special. Punchinello laughed. He said, me special? you got to be kidding. My paint's chipped. Can't walk straight. A little bit bow-legged. My paint is peeling. Why do I matter to you? Eli looked at Punchinello, put his hands on those small wooden shoulders, and said, because you're mine. That's why you matter to me. Punchinello had never had anybody talk to him like that before, much less his maker. He didn't know what to say. Every day I've been hoping you'd come, Eli the woodcarver explained. I came because I met someone who had no marks. Yeah, she told me about you. Why don't the stickers stay on her? The maker spoke softly because she has decided that what I think is more important than what they think. The stickers only stick if you let them. What? The stickers only stick if they matter to you. The more you trust my love, the less you care about their stickers. I'm not sure I understand, said Punchinello. Woodcarver smiled and he said, you will understand, but it'll be a process. For now, just come to see me every day and let me remind you how much I care. 
Remember, Eli said, as the women walked out the door, you are special because I made you and I don't make mistakes. Punchinello didn't stop, but in his heart he thought, I think he really means it. And when he did, can you see that? A dot fell to the ground and bounced. Amen. I'm sorry? Is You Are Special by Max Licato. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm only on, this would be a really great place for you guys to talk, but <laughs> um, just to review real quick. Some of the solvents that began to wash Punchinello, what, what do you think? What are the solvents that washed Punchinello? What did you hear? Did you? Sorry? You have to speak up real loud. Love, Love yeah, for sure. And love all over the place, you know, the Lucia, She's, she was an evangelist. She, uh, here's a person who did not give out dots or stars, and she welcomed him and accepted him. And, um, and she was a good model, too. She seemed unaffected by other people's negative comments, or their positive ones, really. She had a relationship with the woodcarver that just brought her through. Um, another solvent, realizing that his creator made him and even named him and welcomed his visits. Realizing that his creator was big, okay? He walks into that wood shop and man, he's dwarfed, you know? And that, and that the woodcarver was big enough to see the truth, to see the big picture, to see what was going on down in the village, to see that there were things down there that weren't quite right and that he had the answer to those things if he was trusted. Um, and he demonstrated that the Wemmicks were not only small in size, but they were small in justice, and they were limited in their wisdom. And they were small in their power to make the dar dots and stars stick compared to the woodcarver's power to make them come off, right? You know? Uh, um, another solvent, I think, Poncinello realized that his uniqueness was lovable and wanted. Um, yeah, that made me think each of us is lovable and each of us is capable in Christ. You know, uh, thinking about people with Down syndrome, people who are, have different kinds of autism, people who, who are immigrants, people who are homeless, you know, to see how we need them, we, how we are them, how we're lovable. The quadriplegics. Um, solvent of fellowship with God, that hanging out with the Creator would help him realize how much he was loved and fathered. None of our fathers are perfect, but we have one who is. And then, the solvent of coming to the Creator daily to be reminded of how much He cares and loves us builds trust. Um, got fascinated with King David. He was, he's a model of this for me. There was one time when he was running from King Saul and he goes to this cave and the Ziphites, he's near the town of Ziph, Z-I-P-H, and uh, the Ziphites say, you know, if we turn this guy in, we might get some money and some, some favor from the king. So. Let's go squeal that David's hiding with us. So they go up there, and they tell Saul, and Saul goes after them. I'm looking at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 13, and I think we have time to go there, so let's just do that. 1 Samuel chapter 23, if you care to read it. Listening's fine, too. 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 13.
Okay, well, so David and his men, about 600 in number, I'm in verse 13 of chapter 23, left Kyla. That was one of the towns he was hanging out in and kept moving from place to place. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Kyla, then remembered uh, Saul's the king and David isn't yet. He's been anointed as the next king, but Saul wants to get him out of the way, kill him. Uh, David stayed in the wilderness strongholds in the hills in the desert of Ziph. Day after day, Saul searched for him, but God did not give him into his hands. When David was at Horesh in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. And if you can put your finger there and go to the right to Psalms, Psalm 54, you'll find the psalm that David wrote while he was in Ziph. And it's kind of, uh, it's not very long, we're not going to read the whole thing, but it's kind of, kind of fun to see this guy who, you know all, all his exploits, but you also can kind of pick up how he felt because he wrote about it. Psalm 54, verse 1. Uh, look at the dedication there. For the director of music with stringed instruments, a masco of David, and he wrote it when the Ziphites had gone to Saul and said, is not David hiding among us? He was kind of being betrayed. Save me, O God, by your name. Verse 1, vindicate me by your might. Hear my prayer, O God. Listen to the words of my mouth. Arrogant foes are attacking me. Ruthless people are trying to kill me. People without regard for God. Bunch of dots there. Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. And now go back to uh, 1 Samuel, same place, 23. We read verse 15, that Saul could come out to take his life. And here's what happened. He, he wrote that psalm probably about then. But then, verse 16, Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horesh and helped him find strength in God. Good to have friends like that. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord. Sometimes Jonathan is pictured as not as brave as David, but I think one of the reasons they liked each other was because Saul, Jonathan, a chapter right before the famous Goliath chapter, Jonathan tells his armor bearer, who's younger than him, that he says, you know, the Philistines are all up there on that cliff, and they're going to attack us. But you know, the Lord can save by two or by many. Let's go up there. And he gets a sign from the Lord that the Lord will be with them. And he goes up there, and he sends all the Philistines running. So when David kills Goliath, Jonathan thinks, I got a friend here. I got somebody who understands God like I do. Um, I love this guy. And, and David loved him, you know? In a, in a real manly, uh, soldier-to-soldier -soldier type of way. Um, then there's another time in 1 Samuel 30 that we're not going to spend a lot of time on where, where David was running from Saul still, and um, they, they also take off and, and do something at another village, and while they're gone, the Amalekites or somebody comes in and they kidnap all of the men's wives and all of their children. And um, David and the men come back and find this, and they, it says they wept bitterly. And then David's men start saying, we ought to stone this guy. It's a bad leader. Let's mutiny. It's just loud and clear there. And then the next verse is, David went and strengthened himself in the Lord. He took off some dots. Those guys had, you know, who were trusting him to be a leader had just turned on him, and that hurts. And uh, God helped him, you know. He had a lot of, a lot of psalms, songs written for him. I guess he took his guitar with him. I guess it was a lyre back in those days, a L-Y-R-E, you know, one of those harp type things. Um, um, Catherine and some other people, we've been talking a lot about um, inner healing. That's a really good solvent, too. I, uh, I had thought that we wanted to talk about this before I went to Inner Healing last Sunday, but it's kind of fit. And by the way, 
another um, really good solvent, I think, on the identity issue is to go watch the movie Overcomer. It just started out this weekend, but it's another Alex Kendrick film, like Courageous, like, what are the others, War Room, and uh, you'd like it. Just saying. This is the weekend when they decide whether they're going to send it to a whole lot of other theaters. So showing five times a day, today at uh, 10 o'clock p.m. and 7 and 4.20, I think, 7.10. Anyway. Um, but inner healing can be a great solvent for dots and stars, for knocking down barriers that, present, that prevent closeness with God. Last Sunday, the inner healing team that Pastor Dave and Joe, and in this case, Catherine, asked the Holy Spirit what needed to be addressed in me, kind of go chronologically through it, and God zoomed in on my relationship with my dad. I had, always, I had already had partial hearing from... I had already had partial healing from some of the resentments toward him, like for not understanding or hanging out with me or maybe enjoying me more. And I had officially forgiven him, okay? And uh, got some healing from it. I understood my resentment and distrust of him was, was just partly responsible for a sexual addiction that was a real sticky mess. God helped me remember three positive memories of dad's rescuing and then holding me as a boy of about eight. I felt and realized in my heart that he did love me. I felt it vividly, and I was able to forgive him more deeply for the times when he did sin against me, you know, harshly or whatever. And I, in that prayer time, I told him more sincerely than ever before and tearfully that I saw that he did love me, and I, I felt like a dot fell off. <laughs> a bit like Punchinello. I thought in my heart, I think he really means it. I think Dad really means it. And somehow that broke down more of another wall, which is sort of my kind of distrust against my will of, of God loving me. I, I've never been totally able to feel that as much as I think a lot of you have. I think a lot of you have felt God's love. You know. Anyway, that kind of knocked it down. Um, so that's one, that was the dot that went away. Uh, I think stars were a problem too, maybe for all of us. It's nice to receive compliments, to get raises, to get high grades, to be the most valuable player on the team, but sometimes it seems like I can never get enough, that the satisfaction and the wholeness and the sense of well-being that I hope for is elusive, that I have to keep proving myself, and I never quite arrive. Have you ever been there? For instance, I received a, <clears throat> a lot of A's in high school. I was good at taking tests. But my confidence and my peace level was never at a high level. And the nearly straight A's certainly did not guarantee a lot of A's in college. And it mattered to me. It was a sticky mess. Sort of like the wooden people in this story, I felt like I kept, I needed to keep on getting stars of excellence. Most of the gray dots that were awarded for my performance came from, guess who? Me. Last Sunday, the inner healing team asked the Holy Spirit what else needed to be addressed, and God put his finger on a drive for excellence gone awry. The spirit inherited from my family that obsessively drives one to a high level of excellence, and then drives one to judge themselves when you fall short. Sometimes that was driven by pride and could even propel me into arrogance, but the team was able to apply the solvent to wash away some of the dots and, most importantly, wash away the source of that dot, which was this, I think, dark spirit that probably resulted from both my grandfathers taking pledges to excellence with demonic help in a men's fraternity called Masons. Have you heard of that one? Joe led me in an echo prayer to renounce that spirit. Thanks. <laughs> Now I'm freer to take to heart that my identity and significance are in Jesus loving me, that I'm his child, and that Jesus, my woodcarver, gave me talents and skills that describe me, but they're not my core identity. My core identity, your core identity, is that Jesus loves you. Amen. You belong to him, you know? 
feel like a gray dot. Another one fell off in the process of becoming free. I said process of another chain and more like Jesus got a real boost. Jesus doesn't love me more as a result. Dave wanted me to emphasize that. You know, you get rid of these things and Jesus doesn't love us more. It's his love that gets us through the process. But his delight, you know, in us, that's my girl. That's my boy. That's my son. That, that can grow. And I'm just wondering, it's kind of your turn. Uh, I'm wondering if you have dots, like other people's condemnations that need to be erased by God's true and um, loving opinions. Or maybe you have stars, places where you're successful and you rely on attaboys from other people. And, um, it, and they need to be deprived of power, okay? If you, f if you feel that way. Um, in our prayer, let's ask God to either begin that process, identify the dots or the stars, or continue it. I bet a lot of us know that we're, you know, in process. That those, you know, I, I was just thinking, we're not going to look like this until we get zapped by Jesus and go to heaven. So it's sort of like we're always going to be a little bit this, and a little bit this, but we're going to be making progress toward, toward this. And parts of our lives will be relatively clean so that people can see what's inside. You know? so, um, and then the other option is maybe you have somebody on your heart who has stars or dots or both, and you'd like to be a solvent giver in that situation. And prayer, of course, is one way to impact that hugely. But maybe God will tell you to do something. So anybody who has stars or dots that, they, that God is talking to them about or um, knows people that God has placed on your heart, let's stand up and just, I'll pray real quick, okay? Or you can sit down, it doesn't matter. <laughs>